as you know, you're the author of the book, How to Fight Anti-Semitism. I think one of the most important books to read, Jewish, non-Jewish, it's really about how we understand hate in the world and how we come to combat it. The founder of the newsletter, Common Sense, and the host of the podcast, Honestly with Barry Weiss. From 2017 to 2020, Barry was an opinion writer and editor at the New York Times. We'll talk about that departure and how you guys are making change both from within and from without. Before that, she was an op-ed, and before that, you were op-ed and book review editor at the Wall Street Journal and a senior editor at Tablet Magazine, one of my favorite reads. And Nellie, the better half, I'm not sure who would argue that, but uh, until recently, you were a reporter for the New York Times, focused on business, tech, and culture. You resigned in November 2021 and now also write for Common Sense. Prior to joining the Times, you were a correspondent for Vice News Tonight on HBO and a writer for The Guardian, Recode, and California Sunday. You're currently writing a book of essays, and I am so moved by your blog, Chosen by Choice, which we'll get to in detail today. But let me just say, the two of you are fire. That's what my teenagers would say. You're just fire. Yes. Yes, you're just fire. And if, yes. I, 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 my teenagers are probably horrified and embarrassment right now that I'm not <laughs> saying that, but I had to say it. So welcome. I'm so glad the both of you are here. Thanks for having us. It's such Let's get right here. into it. Barry, you're the daughter of a mother who sold was a buyer for makeup and your dad was a salesman. Nellie, you were a debutante in San Francisco. I mean, what we Jews know as like wasp royalty. <laughs> How did the two of you find each other, fall in love and get oh, married and connect? Great question. Great let- question. We met at the Times. We met in the cafeteria. Bear had written me about some story idea that was like, conservatives are being deplatformed on tech platforms. You should write about it. And I was at the time like, horrified by that idea. I was like, come on, a bunch of concern. That's not true. And I was like, you know, I happen to be in New York. Let's get coffee. And and we got coffee just in on the fifth floor. And I was smitten. And it was like, was it love at first sight? Was it love at first sight? I think for Nellie, it was love at first sight. For me, was it for you, Barry? Um, I, I thought she was intriguing and interesting, but was not exactly, as you just noted, Sherry, the profile of the kind of person that I was looking for or thought I would end up with. Um, And the other- It took six months of hard work on mine. (laughs) Let's just be- Ellie, everything of value takes hard work. (laughs) But you know what? All that matters- she won. Yeah. I won. But and, I, I, I got her to said, California. Let's visit the ring. Let's visit the ring. I, I think. <laughs> I think the other part of it was that you know Nellie sort of referenced it, but we were very much in. She was up. I was down. Let's just be frank. And she was sort of like in the mix of people at the paper who had cachet. She was kind of like the golden girl, and politically very much, um, at least the way I perceived her at the time, like in the slipstream of let's just say broadly like conventional wisdom at the New York Times. And I was already sort of under siege and frankly, just happy that anyone wanted to have coffee with me and be friends with me. I did not expect that that would lead to conversion, marriage, moving across the country, trying to start a family. Like I could never have anticipated it from that moment. Um, the dogs. But but maybe, it, you know, maybe it's for sure. I actually think it's Bashir, but I think also what you're talking about, Barry, is about sacrifice. People think love is about compromise, but love is about sacrifice. And you just named a number of sacrifices, even the way you sacrificed your way of thinking. So what have you individually had to give up to be together and to be in the world? I think like I always very easily fit into the mainstream of my community of like sort of gay San Francisco and um, and then sort of the mainstream of my media community. And I loved being in it and I liked being liked. Um, and I had to learn to be okay with not always being completely liked. And that was hard. Like, yeah, that was sort of, um, it took like a year to get over it. And then, uh, and then my initial reaction was to sort of backlash against it and be like, well, then I hate the mainstream media. And I, 
I, these communities are terrible. And now I've kind of settled into a more moderate like um, zone. But yeah, I think for me, it was like giving up just the ease of being liked and not being controversial really for anything. You've right, also, no one, one, go ahead, Barry. No, I was gonna say, you've also talked about, you know, I don't know if this is quite the thing you're looking for in this question share, but the, the question of like, what do you give up by becoming a Jew? Oh, well that, yeah. I haven't even gotten there. I just thought first about you can get what there. did you give up in terms of loving each other? Yeah, right? I think, yeah, I think for me. Um, yeah, what'd you give up? <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things um, was guilt, to be honest with you. I don't know if that's giving up, but a sense of, I saw that this person, now my wife's life would be maybe a lot easier um, if she, cause she can, she won't say this, but I think she can fall in love pretty easily. And I know that I'm a person that comes with already when we met to say nothing of now, a lot of baggage, right? I mean, if you Google me, it's not the best Google. And I was, really aware that by being with me, she was sort of like, not hurting herself, that's overstating it, but really being asked to sort of change the direction of things in her career, definitely. And then also as it became clear, somewhat, thank God not as widespread as I had worried, but in her social world. And I think it was only in the past year, if I'm really honest, that that has really faded away. I think that there was just a lot of feeling from me of like, like what have I done a little bit? And- um, To her or to you? Um, from loving her and, and thinking like, wow, like her life would just be so much easier in a way if we hadn't met. And I don't know. I mean, really coming to terms with that has taken me quite a long time. Well, I've gained, I mean, this is, this is neither here nor there with like Jewish stuff and conversion, all of that, but I, I've gained so much more than I lost in that. And I sort of, it's the biggest, I mean, obviously there has been the biggest gift in my life. And also like, it opened my eyes in a lot of ways to the hypocrisy and ridiculousness, ridiculousness and groupthink and like obnoxiousness of the community that I was slipstreaming in. Well, um, so now I want to drill down on that for a second because you were in your community, the gay community, like has certain assumptions about, you know, you can't be pro Zionist, you can't be this, you can't be that. And suddenly you're I not only. I didn't realize that. Like, I didn't know what a litmus test Zionism has become in the progressive world because it was never really on my radar. Yeah. And so when Bear and I first got together, that was like a huge thing. Like, like friends would be like, wait, are you a Zionist? And I would be like, yeah, I guess so. Like, I don't, I don't really follow Israeli news, but like, I guess I think the country should be allowed to exist. And they'd be like shocked. And this was a huge point of tension. And I think even in the last five years since we met and since I started noticing yeah. that, I think it's gotten a lot worse, but it's it's really a litmus test in the community in a way that totally surprised me. And well, she, I, wanted to, I remember early on, Nellie was being like cornered by people asking her about this or that I, specific Israeli policy. And she was like, I haven't even been to this country I, was like, yet. <laughs> I mean, it was, and, and it was like, well, you're complicit. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, but it's, the amount of pressure on people in progressive spaces now and on people in even mainstream liberal spaces yes. to disavow Israel or that whole element of Judaism. I mean, the amount of pressure is enormous. It's really not. I think the amount of pressures on the both of you is extraordinary. And I do want to turn to that. But before I do, I want to say you also made the ultimate sacrifice, which is changing your religion. Right, and we say that we wasn't should... a sacrifice. That that was, uh, I mean, it's right. so. Tell us about it. What was it like? And did Barry yeah. ask you to change your religion? How did it go down? Yeah, she forced me. She she uh, <laughs> she said this is she's a hostage. No, I. There's an idea that if people fall in love and convert to Judaism because their partner is Jewish, that that's somehow like lesser. That there's some embarrassment or something. Uh, for me, 
falling in love with there, part of it was falling in love with Judaism and seeing a Jewish year and seeing the rituals of it and being like, I love this. This is, this really makes sense. And so anyways, then I, um, I took a one-on-one class at um, the kitchen in San Francisco run Noah. by the most amazing rabbi. And it's just, it was an amazing class. And it, I think it was like six months, every Thursday night for three hours. And you had to go to shul every Friday night. And, you know, you, they, you, they kind of were like, part of the class is joining the community and coming to shul. And this was before the pandemic, thank God. Um, and it really clicked for me. So I liked that. And, I, and then I just joined Jewish community. My, my rabbi said, you know, the next step is to live a year on the Jewish calendar. And so I did that and it felt really right and um, brought a lot into my life actually. And so then over the pandemic to kind of continue my learning, cause I could have like done the mikvah and, and finished the conversion, but I kind of wanted to like, I wanted it to feel like really deep and authentic in me. And so, and I wanted to just up my knowledge um, before I finished the process. Although I don't even think the process is ever finished, but um, when the pandemic started to like continue learning, I started blogging about learning and blogging about conversion and like collecting other converts' voices, and that really helped. And then um, that really helped just for me to keep thinking and feeling, thinking about Judaism and feeling other people's conversion journeys and all that. Anyways, and then I well, and then, and then I, you I, write this blog chosen by Choi. And then you also become like kind of a devout Jew, but you're, Barry, you were raised sort of, uh, so suddenly you're married to what often happens, a more driven Jew who chose Judaism. And now you're faced with having a little zealot in your home. So what- I mean, she's like very zealous. I, I, I am the phone police on Shabbat. Yeah, she I, is. If I, if I, if Bear like goes pee and then is gone for like 45 minutes, <laughs> <laughs> and then I walk in and she's just on her computer and I'm like, yeah. what's she, this? What's going on here? <laughs> yeah, no, she, we're like, I mean, like lots of people who will talk about having a spouse that converted. It's like, you are suddenly become, I will say from the start, um, I grew up in a extremely proud Jewish Zionist family, the oldest of four kids. Judaism for me, like there's a lot of, people I know for understandable reasons who have a very complicated relationship to their Judaism or have kind of a chip on their shoulder about it for, again, very understandable reasons. I'm very blessed. I don't have that. It was only a source of like, really like pride and joy. And that was always just like the core part of my identity, really over and above everything else. And um, it was sort of, I think, probably even before we really went on our first date, I was pretty clear that this was something that was enormously important to me. Um, and I will say though, that the experience of watching someone from the outside come in has just A, made me more alive, I think, to what Judaism can offer. And also frankly, more aware of ways that we can improve and become more welcoming um, to people who are essentially, as Nellie always puts it, like seeing a tribe walking through the desert and like wanting to come and join them. And yeah. how do we make that experience? Because in the beginning, I was really, and, and most converts feel this, it's like, is it, is, is Judaism a belief? Is it an ethnicity? What, what is it? How do I make sense of that as someone who's converting? Because, you know, Christianity, it's, it's all belief. It's all like, you need to just have an epiphany of the mind and believe in the thing. And once you do that, the rest is all kind of, that's done. Like it, that's it. Whereas Judaism is not about some one pop belief. It's, it's a, a peoplehood, right? And so I remember I actually, a rabbi came to the kitchen and was speaking and I was asking him, I was like, is it a race? Is it? And he was like, why are you applying your modern American ideas onto this ancient thing? Like that doesn't work. And I, I was sort of struck by it. But yeah, I, I, I visualize it as like, that's what I love Nelly. I love that. And I join that group and that's so that, that I'm working with them. I but, love that. But I will say in the beginning, you know, because I would say our Judaism is like really based around commitment to Jewish community and the Jewish people and, and in all of its complications, 
but in the beginning, that terminology was like so foreign to you. Yeah. Well, was, yeah. I just didn't understand. Well, it's a very Kaplanian sort of behaving, belonging, believing, right? Really feeling those three. Yes. I love branches. that. Right. So it's yes. very, you're, you guys are little reconstructionist Jews, but I don't like labels. So you're just Jews. You're joyful Jews. We're just Jews. Yeah. You're we're just Jews. We're, you're joyful Jews. We're so, post denominations. Nellie, what do you love most about Judaism? Oh, the first thing that that I did and that really clicked for me was Shabbat. And I, I had never seen a Shabbat <laughs> or done a Shabbat. When I first saw them, like when Bear and her friends lighting <laughs> candles and doing the rituals and blessing the wine, I, I wasn't sure what was going to come next. I was a little scared, to be honest. Like, <laughs> I was like, is there going to be like a chicken? Like what's going on? And she was like, is there a sacrifice? <laughs> let this, let this. There is a chicken by the way, but let, 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 let this day. anecdote be your window into what kind of upbringing Nellie had. No, I mean, we're but, talking, but it's like, if you grew up non-Jewish in New York, you would have been to a hundred million Shabbat dinners. Sure. So that's and, and part of actually the, one of the most meaningful parts in the conversion process was really bringing my family into it and really bringing my parents into it. And um, we would have Shabbat dinner at my mom's house. We would light candles. We would sing. And, and just for her to understand it, she came to shul. She met my rabbi like multiple times. Like that was really important because it was, I mean, it was foreign to me. It was way more foreign to my parents. And yeah. so, and that really helped. Anyway, my favorite. I, imagine, I was going to say, how did your parents react? Because I saw in one of your blogs that, you know, when you critique Christianity or your upbringing that your your parents have feelings about it especially your father so how did they react at first they were really supportive um I think you know I mean my mom is really devout and I'm sure on some level she would never say this but I'm sure on some level she was sad maybe but maybe. but she never would say it and she was just so happy that I was like finding religion and finding God and and going to shul like she was so thrilled by that um and and my dad was into it too but he's like kind of conservative and he's more he was like you know he's like a, a right-wing Zionist <laughs> like yeah and I was like okay dad it's not that kind of conversion <laughs> right. like, but and Mary you're one of four girls in your home or women right. and your sister married someone who also converted so clearly you guys are sharing something we're like, a, we're like a non chabad chabad i don't know what's going on in my family but yeah i mean i think maybe my brother-in-law who is incredible italian you know firefighter in pittsburgh um he might be the only person of that profile who's converted in all of pittsburgh but he's amazing and yeah i think like i said before i really think that um Growing up with a Judaism that felt inclusive and like capacious, just to give you a sense of what I mean by that is, you know, Pittsburgh's a small enough Jewish community, unlike New York or LA, where you really don't stay in your like political or denominational lane. So it was very normal in my family to just be moving through segments of Jewish life that people in bigger cities wouldn't. So it would be like every single Friday night and we missed school dances for it was Shabbat dinner and that was sacred. And there could sometimes be 20, 25 people. My dad would show up with an extra half dozen and we would have to do the infamous family hold back. Um, we I'm have sure he kept back sharing. They yeah. have really I grew up in the same Jewish home. home. So we have great Shabbats, but then it was like, we'd go to our conservative synagogue. My sister and I became the youngest Torah readers there. Then we might go to a Chabad family for lunch. And then we might go to play basketball, at the JCC, you know? And so it was like, that was normal for us. And so I think I mean, a Judaism that is about sort of um, not putting litmus tests to people. And, and really I will reference Chabad here, meeting people where they are. Um, in a way that I think they do almost better than any other group. I didn't even know that that was a special thing to be raised with, but I was absolutely raised with that mentality. Um, and, you know, my parents really believe and raised me to believe that someone who converts to Judaism is like, was there at Sinai, like they're just as Jewish as anyone else. In fact, more so. And, um, 
Yeah. yeah, that's what I tell you all the time. <laughs> well, I think that's a beautiful segue, Barry, because I think you were raised to move fluidly and organically in and out of institutional life. And by the way, we're big fans of Chabad. Shout out to Chabad. They're big followers on the platform. They're awesome. non-denominational, non-political. So that doesn't mean we don't have difficult conversations. But, but my point being is, do you think that Jewish upbringing enabled you to deal with sort of the moving in and out of institutions. You were deeply ensconced in the New York Times. You were ensconced in the Wall Street Journal. Same with you, Nellie. And now you guys are out of that. And do you think that's given you an eye towards how do we make change? I'll say, hmm. I'll say two things. You want to go first? No, you go. That's interesting. I'll say two things to it. The first is that Judaism is my anchor and Jewish values and being feeling like I am a part of Jewish history and that I have a, maybe a tiny, tiny role to play in it, or at least I need to live up to the sacrifices that were made for me. That's like my ballast. And so when you're talking, I don't think of it as like institutional periphery center, not, I think about it as is this thing that I am a part of, whether it's an institution or a community or something else, harmonious, at least in large part with those values, or are they discordant? And I think that like having those values at the center of my life very, very deeply has allowed me to make some very hard professional choices, if that makes sense. It's yeah, like, more than that, it's given you the bravery to say that this is no longer acceptable. I need to use my Jewish values to move forward through the wilderness, which is a perfect timing for right now. Go ahead with Nelly. Well, no, it's like that quote that's like, um, live your life in a boring way so that your work can be wild and violent or something like that. Like, um, and I think Judaism and just having, I mean, just all of the, having a stable home and a stable center and a stable yes. moral center is really important for being able to like, have risky wild work and yes and this is like something that my mom would always tell me when I was growing up and I or when I was like in my 20s and stuff and I never totally understood it but it's so true like having a structured life and a schedule and it it and people and, that like and you know Friday is Shabbat and yeah and I don't like, know it lets you be wilder and it lets you be more risk-taking because the fundamentals aren't in question yeah who's the more risky and, one and I think oh bear for sure but it I bears risk taking just as a person. I'm a very conservative. I don't like change. I don't like fast <laughs> movements. I I don't I don't I'm wary of even the whole like starting a media empire versus just a nice simple newsletter. Just a I well I the, the, I'll add one thing which is that well two things. I think also just if your whole meaning of your life, right, is about and and we're very ambitious but is about you know worldly material success or even more intoxicating maybe like popularity and being liked like you're you would be crushed you know if you live through some of the things that people in public life are being asked to live through right now but if you have a core value structure that is fundamentally not tied to what people on the internet are saying about you um you will be, I mean, it's extraordinarily liberating, genuinely. Um, the other thing I'll say is how this, I think, ties into Judaism and institutional, non-institutional. Listen, I think like the history of the Jewish people, the history of Judaism is about rebuilding and rebuilding often in the wake of like total decim destruction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times when people are like, you know, even, even in my own family, so I'm like, I can't believe you left the New York Times or like, how could you walk away from this or any number of decisions we've made. And it's kind of like, hold on. So like, you're like, if you look at the scheme of what our history is, it's like Judaism was rebuilt, you know, to be a Judaism without animal sacrifice, a Judaism without the temple, like not to be too crazy here, but it's like, they could do that and like re like totally reimagine what Judaism is. Okay, like we can leave a newspaper and start a blog <laughs> online. It's right, let's get some perspective, mom and dad. Which exactly, I think it's, it's just like 
there's, I don't know. And I, I also just feel like actually we're talking about small things and small, exactly. risks. like actually it's like getting yelled at on Twitter is a small thing. It's, it's not meaningful. It's not a real risk. I mean, well, well, I love that you guys have that perspective. And one could also say that, you know, you are the subject and uh, target of a lot of hate from all different angles. And it really strikes me that your Jewish foundation really grounds you. But what happens, I know for me, when I'm upset or someone criticizes me, I'm okay with me. My husband's ready to kill them, right? Yeah. Now, now that you're in a partnership, what is it like for you? I'll start with you, Nelly, when Barry is attacked and vice versa. Barry, what's it like for you when Nelly's attacked and how do you feel protective of one another? I it's I, <laughs> I love get, this. I'm I, scary. <laughs> no, I mean, I get mad. Like at this point, years into it, I'm not looking at Barry's Twitter mentions or something like that. Like I'm not like like doing self-harm and looking at like, <laughs> like, like although some people drink like too much, people eat too much, but then the self-harm is like looking over at no, someone's like, Twitter. I and and at this point it feels more distant, but like when it was starting and we were to, like just together and I mean, it drove me crazy. Yeah. And I, I responded with rage. I responded with rage <laughs> and, and actual hate is what, what I would say. What did that look like, Nellie? <laughs> it, it looks like me going on a tear, walking around the house, driving myself crazy, talking and yeah, like not yelling, but being like, I can't believe this. I'm never like this people you know, and, and responding with, you know, just going further in my heart and mind than I actually feel like being like, God, oh, should all burn down. Like, I hope the paper shuts down tomorrow. Like, and, and now I, I have, like I said, softened about that, but yeah, I was really angry. It was really hard to see that and to see how irrational it is and how, how much of a lie it is. Like um, the things that people say about bear. And or so many, or, or so many people. Yeah, people we who we love. A lot I of mean, people, not just this one. Lots of them. And uh, anyways, it, 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 at first it caused rage and that thankfully settled. What do you think was that shift to tip it from being, because also when you're so rageful, it doesn't give the person the opportunity to feel comfortable to share with you their own frustrations, right? Because you kind of then take it from yeah, then Bear was having to comfort me. Yes. But I had already gotten to much more of a Zen place with it because I had been living with it for a while. And I have to tell you, it doesn't even, I don't want to sound callous. It doesn't affect me anymore. Large do that, Barry. I mean, certain things do, certain things do. And I will say that, you know, one of the things that I think, how do I say this? I think there is just tremendous comfort in general for human beings, but especially in this moment, maybe with being sort of welcomed into a political tribe. And if you resist any number of sort of litmus tests from either one of, you know, let's call it red tribe and blue tribe, you're going to find yourself sort of being pushed out or having your sort of um, loyalty questioned. And what I think we're trying to do is build, like show what it looks like to live outside of those tribes um, and make a, and this is definitely what, one of the things we're trying to and do with common actually, sense. There's a lot of people who are- in, and, then, and then it's the majority of people. Who are moderate and kind. And that like, like part of getting over the rage was me realizing that this is a tiny fraction of America who's acting like this. The majority of America, including the majority of American liberals, are moderate and kind and good and not raging about Barry or whatever. But it's a tiny sliver of angry, crazy people who happen to have very important positions of power in American media and and beyond and beyond. Yeah, but like, but I think one yeah. one of the like all of the incentives right online are pushing people to those extremes. And I think one of the things that's been core for us, and I'm not just saying this because we're on an AJU panel, is like genuinely moving away from online life. I mean, we're our job requires us to live online, right? But unplugging from online life and, and rooting down in real relationships. And I would say like, Shabbat dinner and and yeah. that community that like keeps us going 
I mean, you said that last Friday night after we left the Shriers, like it kept, yeah. it was like, you're in the glow of that. And it carries you through till Thursday when you're like, I need a fix again. And yeah. then you go again. Right. But just in case this new media company doesn't work out, I think you'll both be great rabbis. And we do have a rabbinical school. <laughs> so just FYI. So I do want to give it. Judaism offers that third option. So yes, like, yes. When, when, when I was like kind of being, feeling myself being ousted and ousting myself from the sort of like far left progressive world, it's not like I wanted to join the right wing. Like I'm a lesbian in LA, right? Like I'm not going to like be a, some like red state Trumper and be like, and have that be a natural home. I, but it's like, oh, you're being embraced by the right. But, but so for me, in a lot of ways, I, I think I got even more serious about Judaism yes. and about feeling part of Jewish community in part because it felt like a third option of like a community. Like it, it, yes, it, 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 it it's, it's, allergic to extremism in ways that actually have been amazing. And, and even Jewish conservatives won't go as like- uh, the Afghanistan I, thing. Yeah, like when when it came to, you describe that because I'm gonna mess it up. Uh, I'm gonna mess it up too. But but basically there's a callousness, I think that we're and the reacting to and a nihilism. And to when, get some conservative thinkers that, you, uh, that there's not a nihilism in Judaism that- No, not at all. And in fact, I think what you guys are describing, it's, it's not very newsworthy to be moderate and not to sit on the fringes of extremism. There, there's another element to it, I think, that is actually like at the structure of Judaism itself, which is that you can't, I mean, of course we have our extremes and of course you can spin off, but because Judaism literally requires you to be in a room with other people mm -hmm. and not with a tiny number, right? With 10 people or Shabbat, whatever it is in all Shiva, all of Jewish life. It's like, you have to learn to live with other people who disagree with you. It's like, you don't, it's, you don't get the kind of luxury, which is not actually a luxury, but it seems like a luxury to just like swaddle yourself in your own views, because ideally what's happening is that you're rubbing up against you know, sorry, we're over COVID, but like you're rubbing up against <laughs> other people, you know, who think differently than you. And I think that that just fundamentally in a time where most people are living more and more online, it's just such a powerful antidote to the dehumanization that online life allows for, and maybe even um, catalyzes. So beautiful the way you said that, Barry. I just had this image of a New York subway where we have to be yes. together and yes. intellectually engage. Do you two have political disagreements, um, or have your agree has your political become more aligned since you've been together? Yes and yes, but I'll let Melly answer that one. Well, I'd say I'm correct in politics, and Barry <laughs> tends to be wrong. <laughs> Next question. No, I, okay. I, de okay. <laughs> no, um, I, our, I'm, we're both moderates, right? Like neither of us are, we're, neither of us are on an extreme. And so we're not like getting in wild political disagreements, but I think in the beginning more we did in the beginning more, I think we still have our fundamental disagreements. We have a few, like we joke that we have some like, like, disagreements that are going to stay with us till the end. Barry still doesn't think my Jordan Peterson profile was good. And <laughs> I think it was brilliant. So we have certain things where I will win in the end. Um, but yeah, I, I will. Absolutely. I do think that we've moved like many couples or maybe not. I don't know. Um, become more aligned. And yeah. I, but I also think that's because of the moment that we're living in where like it feels like a radical position to sort of reject both of these extremes. Um, yeah, to say like, we both agree that like schools should be open and teachers unions are being a little crazy. And like, we're kind of in the same sort of mushy moderate. I think sometimes like, again, when I first was getting kind of angry about being sort of ousted from the left, the left's good standing. I think I was more conservative than Barrett for Definitely. a little while. Like I was more sympathetic to the to the right and more sort of like, um, you know what? Yeah, we got to fight hard. And and that I don't think was healthy. But yeah, I, I in the end, I mean, for about a year was arguing to Barrett's right most of the time. 
it was really weird because when we met, I was like, she's, she's woke. And like, I, you know, I was sort of in the center, maybe center right in the context of the times. And then all of a sudden she was to my right. The one thing I think we do a, a pretty good job of in each other is making sure that we don't get like hardened yes. is how we talk about it. How do you explain that? Um, I think it's really easy when you are, it's sort of what Nellie was describing, like the, the hatred and the rage when you're hated online and when you're lied about. No, or when a friend yeah. is, is, you know, having me against the wall, asking me about Israeli policy and making yeah. me feel like I'm not allowed in sort of progressive spaces. If I don't like she's bad certain, now, have a certain opinion on Israel, then it's then, really, then it's like, well, those are bad spaces. And I have to, you know, we have to guard that because they're wrong about certain things, but it's still a good gay bar. Right. And I, <laughs> and I also think that any good partner both challenges you and shapes you and helps you bring your beliefs together. I've been married 20 plus years and I can tell you my husband and I were not in the same political camp at, when we started and we've come together in very different ways, but still there's a real respect for views and ideas. Yeah. And I'll say, you know, I grew up in a politically mixed marriage. My dad is a conservative. My mom is a liberal. Um, and they're probably one of the most in love couples that I know. And so that it's did- It's really funny to hear them talk politics. Yeah, but like that never intimidated. Like the idea of being with someone yeah. who disagreed with me, I was like, yeah, like, and I think it's quite- um, I mean, it's fun. Like it's our, fun, yeah. We love talking. It, I mean, this is our life. All we do is talk politics and yeah. sort of like- I think the core thing is that right now, I think you tell me if you disagree with this, but it feels like the bedrock values, right? That allow for a conservative and a liberal to be married to each other. And to say that that's good and that there are certain things that supersede politics, like family and relationships and love, it feels like that thing itself, which I think of as liberalism broadly defined, is under question, right? Like there's a lot of people right now who don't want that to be a possibility. And I think that people on both sides, and that is what we're fighting for fundamentally is like the bedrock of liberalism that allows us to even have those disagreements and have those relationships in the first place. And to say that that's good, not just like, not just neutral, but that that's a positive. And that that's one of the best things about America. So beautifully said, truly from Olam Haba is smiling down on both of us, <laughs> on the two of you, because you are literally adhering to that statement, if not now, when, and if not, if not who, me.